Okay, so everybody, everybody hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so I just un I just unmuted everyone again. Whoever is here on the phone number, the four nine nine, just try to sign in um, with your name, and then uh, also Israel, if you could sign in with your name, that would be great. Okay, I'm I'm going to mute everyone just because it's gets a little noisy. Uh, okay, so first thing I just wanted to talk about was the the new um, document that the State Department of Health put out the other day, uh, revolving you know around cardiac arrest and stuff. It's not a greatly worded uh, document, but supposedly it's going to uh, be revised. Okay, so this pertains both to ALS and uh, and BLS. Okay. And um, it's in effect until rescinded. So, I mean, if they don't rescind it after the whole COVID thing is done, it'll still be into effect. So obviously it applies only to adult patients over the age of uh, 18 years of age. Okay, and let's go down and take a look at it. Okay. Okay, so if the patient has obvious signs of death, dependent lividity, rigor mortis, or anything like that, then, you know, just like always, we don't start resuscitation. You should never start. If they have any type of advanced directive um, indicating that they don't want anything done, um, you should also not start anything, uh, any type of resuscitation. Now, we had a big discussion with our medical directors, Dr. Wasserman at, at Good Sam and um, Dr. Raybridge at NIAC about, we've had some situations where the patient had a valid DNR and was in cardiac arrest and the family rescinded it. The family said, we want you to do everything. So, you know, if you're on that call and the medics are there, they're going to call medical control. They're going to start working the patient, but they're going to call medical control and explain to them that there's a valid DNR, but the family's rescinding it. And they are going to try, medical control will try to talk to the family and explain to them that, you know, they, um, their family member wanted a, um, you know, their family, the, their family member wanted not to be resuscitated. It's in writing and, you know, you're going against what your family member wants. But if it's going to turn into a dispute or anything like that, then I guess we're just going to have to work the patient. Um, but again, it's going to be 20 minutes. So we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So those would be the, the over here we're talking about the do not in initiate. So if there's any signs of obvious death. So remember, before you ever start resuscitating a patient, you have to roll them okay, onto their side and see if there's any dependent lividity on the part of the body that's closest to the ground when you find them. So if they're on their back, it would be their lower back, okay, behind their thighs, probably won't be their shoulder blades or their buttocks because it's pressed up against the ground. And if they're face down, you know, it really would depend on, you know, how they're laying, but usually it's the front of their thighs. If you see any, uh, like a purplish discolorization, that means they've been down for greater than 20 minutes and we don't work them. Okay, so in the, um, the cardiac arrest. So did EMS witness the patient coding? Okay, so it's not the family telling you they witnessed it. Did you witness the patient coding? If no, okay, so single provider in PP applies the AD monitor. Okay, if it's a shockable rhythm, then you could start resuscitating the patient, which means you could defibrillate the patient. Okay, if it's a non-shockable rhythm, so that would be a systole and PEA, pulseless electrical activity, the machine's gonna tell you no shock is indicated. If that's the case, then you do not do anything. You just actually let them go. You don't start CPR, you don't do anything. Okay, if they're in a shockable rhythm where the AED lets you defibrillate, then you're going to defibrillate and take it from there. You know, I mean, if by some miracle, they come back with a pulse, then check their breathing. If they're not breathing, ventilate them. And if they start breathing and, uh, and have a pulse, then you, know, you had a true save and we'll have to figure out what to do at that point. Now, as far as resuscitation goes, okay? So it says BVM should only be used with an advanced airway and if a viral filter is present. So that means that if the paramedics are not there, you are not gonna start ventilating them with the bag valve mask unless you have, have a bag valve mask that has a viral filter built in, which I would say that none of you have, okay? Now, we do have viral filters on the ALS side, but I'll tell you that probably soon we will not have them. We're running out of them very quickly. And if that's the case, if there's no um, viral filter, what's gonna happen is you're going to put a... Um, 
well, first of all, I'm sorry, just go back to CPR is not going to be regular CPR, just compression only CPR. If there's no viral filter, our airway management is going to be that we're going to insert an oral airway, okay, or a nasal airway. It's probably going to be an oral airway, okay. Let me just admit everybody that it was a little late coming in. Okay. Okay, so, you know, going back again. So we're gonna do compression only CPR. Okay, we're gonna insert an oral airway. Okay, for some reason you can't get an oral airway and a nasal airway. Okay, then we're gonna put a surgical fit mask on the patient's face, not an N95 or regular surgical mask. Okay, so that's gonna basically just, you know, go over their, their mouth and their nose. And then over that, we're gonna put a non rebreather face mask at 10 liters per minute. So I know this sounds a little weird because you're gonna say the patient's not breathing, but when you're doing CPR, you're changing the diameter of the thorax of the chest by compressing. And there's actually some passive breathing that goes on when that occurs. So they're actually sucking in a little bit of air and what you're doing is you're basically, you know, super oxygenating that air that's coming in, okay? And I'll open this up for everybody to have questions in a second, okay? The paramedics are not supposed to be intubating anymore. They're supposed to be using a King airway or what's called a superglottic airway, okay? Um, and again, they would only do that if they have viral filters. So if they, if you responded, started BLS, did the OPA, the surgical mask and the non rebreather and they showed up and we've run out of viral filters, they're gonna maintain the patient the exact same way that you are, okay? Um, they can initiate um, ALS treatment other than airway if they choose to. So in other words, they could administer medications, start a IV, start an intraosseous and all that stuff if they choose to. Okay, but at the 20 minute mark, if the patient does not come back with a pulse and a perfusing rhythm, they're gonna terminate the code, okay, just like you would. So that's basically what we're faced with. Let me just scroll down, make sure there's nothing else important, okay. Um, so Frank, at 20 minute mark, that means we're no longer, this is no longer a load and go scenario, this is a work it on scene? No, at 20 minutes, you're stopping. You worked it on scene for 20 minutes. You're not, okay, so I, I don't know if, you know, what, what's going on, you know, but you should not be transporting cardiac arrests unless they come back, right? So if you have a cardiac arrest that comes back with a pulse, then you're going to transport it. Everything else gets left in the house. So in this situation- So we're going to stay and work it on scene until we get pulses back. No, you're going to stay and work it for 20 minutes. And if at 20 minute mark, there are no pulses, you're going to pronounce the patient or the paramedics are going to- you know, right, but normally we're not on scene and we're we're at the hospital in under 20 minutes. Um, okay, ideally, but I don't know if that always happens. But yes, I see what you're saying. So yes, you're going to stay on the scene working that patient unless they come back with a pulse. If they come back with a pulse, then you're going to initiate transport. If they don't come back with a pulse, you're going to work it for 20 minutes. And at the end of 20 minutes, you're going to, you know, I guess, render psychological first aid to the family and say, you know, I'm sorry, we've done everything we can, but there's nothing more to be done for your loved one. Okay, so any other questions? Okay. Any other questions on that? So again, you come in, you find a patient, okay, that you did not witness, dead on the ground, okay, then you're gonna not do anything. You're just going to leave that patient right there, okay, and, you know, do, uh, do nothing else, okay. Um, I'm sorry, actually, it says EMS witness, no, single breast, oh, so you, I'm sorry. So you you did not, with the, you did not with the, witness them code, okay? You are gonna put the AED on them. If it's shockable, okay, then you're going to resuscitate them. If it's non-shockable, you're not gonna do anything. So I, I left the step out of putting the AED on. Frank, if you, hold on one second. If you witness the cardiac arrest in front of you, then you're going to pretty much do the same thing, which is you're gonna start your regular resuscitation using the AED, but the airway part is what changes. Go ahead, Yuda. Um, so I'm not starting with compressions, I'm starting with an AED? Well, if so you I witness- find this patient on the floor, I didn't witness it, I walk up to him. First thing I do is I slap on pads or I start compressions? Um, I, would, I would, personally, I would put on pads because if he's a non-shockable rhythm, you're not going to do anything. Okay. So right. it's, it's really if they're in V-fib or not in V-fib that makes the determination of whether or not they're gonna be worked at that point if you did not witness it. Frank, mm -hmm. so I had a patient, um, possible DOA. I got there, the body was still warm. Mm -hmm. um, 
I checked for, you know, for uh, validity, whatever it's called. I didn't see anything. Uh -huh. um, so I just put the patient, put the, you know, the body on the floor, started CPR. Uh, medics arrived, so they uh, put on the, uh, their pads and stuff. It was a systole, so they just canceled on the spot. Right. Yep. But should I not have started CPR, rather put the pads you saying? So I would have, I mean, again, you're totally by yourself. So I would have, if you're following this protocol, the new protocol that came out the other day, they're saying put the pads on because if you get a no shock indicated uh, message, then you're going to stop resuscitation. Got it. Okay. Okay. So any questions on the cardiac arrest, um, the new cardiac arrest algorithm that came out? So I sent this to, uh, to everybody. Um, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. I sent it to... Um, to Chris, Zevi, and Yaakov. So they should uh, disseminate this to you guys if they didn't already. Okay, and this is what the medics are using. Now, trust me, there's a lot of questions on it. I mean, you know, everybody's kind of like, whoa, you know. Um, now, just the, the words over here I wanted to look at over here, providers in PP appropriate, okay, for aerosol generating procedures. Just so you know, the anything that causes the patient's COVID virus to be put out into the air is considered an aerosol generating procedure. So if the patient was coughing or sneezing or anything like that, that's an aerosol generating procedure you know, on their own. But one of the things, um, you know, one of the things that's absolutely um, aerosol generating procedure, okay, would be the bag valve mask, would be suctioning, would be inserting an oral airway or nasal airway, would be CPAP, would be a nebulizer. So let's say you had a, a COVID patient that's alive in a respiratory distress, and you give them a nebulizer without having a viral filter on it, you have put yourself at great risk in the back of that ambulance. I mean, without a doubt, even with PPE on, unless you really had fit tested tight PPE, and I know some of you have facial hair, so there's just no way you have tight fitting PPE, you're putting yourself at massive risk um, of you know, exposing yourself to the virus. So really, you know, the way it's going right now is that the ambulance has become a transport mechanism. Um, you, you know, get them to, if they're alive and in respiratory distress, you know, by all means, put them on some oxygen the way they're describing here, which is a surgical mask over their face and then an oxygen mask over that and get them to the, um, get them to the hospital. Minimize the time, takes you to get to the hospital and minimize, you know, what you're doing for the patient. So we're really in the, you know, the taxi cab mode. Um, and it's really just to protect us. Um, make sure you give good notification to the hospital. Okay, so they can, you know, be ready for you, prepared. I know they're inundated and overwhelmed, so there's probably not much they're going to be able to do, but still just try to give them a heads up, okay? And you'll just see, I mean, the chances of a cardiac arrest getting transported, I'm sure those of you that are out there actually still, you know, transporting patients, you see that you're really not transporting cardiac arrest. You, know, you should not be transporting cardiac arrest. It's going to be the pretty rare cardiac arrest that gets transported. They would have to come back. You know, they would have to come back with a pulse to be transported, so they're not in cardiac arrest anymore. Frank, mm -hmm. witnessed arrest. Yep. This says unwitnessed. What do you do about witnessed? No, it says witnessed right here. So if you look, the EMS witnesses, yes. Okay, begin resuscitation. So you're going to do the same thing. You're going to put them now on the, the defibrillator. Okay, if it says to shock them, you're going to shock them. If it says not to shock them, that means they're in a systole or PEA. So you're going to continue to do CPR for 20 minutes, but don't transport. You know, we don't transport people without pulses. So if you have a cardiac arrest, and again, if once ALS gets there, they're just going to tell you to stop. So you don't really, you're not going to probably be working it for, you know, the full 20 minutes, I'm sure. Well, again, it depends on where Medic 23 is and stuff like that, but it can, uh, you know, I'm sure it could take them a few minutes to get down to you. Okay, so the only thing different between witnessed and not a witnessed is how quick you uh, pronounce them. Okay, so any questions? Frank, regarding the patient needs a mask, mask, right? The patient needs to have a surgical mask applied, yes. Okay, the problem is I would say 50% of our patients are old people from the prominent and they just pull it off. Is there anything else we can do? Now, what do you, what do you, well, here we were talking about cardiac arrest, so they're not pulling it off, but you're talking about a patient who's uh, alive. But you said before the ambulance is crazy that everything is in, a virus is going into the ambulance, right? The nebulizer and everything. 
So you're saying, no, so if you're using a nebulizer on a patient, which you probably should not be using, but if you're using a nebulizer on a patient, there would be no way to have a mask because the nebulizer is going to their mouth. So either way, whatever way you do it, they still pull off the mask. All these old people pull it off. Mm -hmm. So we're still at risk with every patient. Then you shouldn't put them, then you shouldn't do it. I mean, if they're not going to allow you to do it in a way that's safe, then you shouldn't do it. And just document that you tried to do it, but you know they they wouldn't allow, you know they wouldn't allow you to do it in a safe way. I mean, there's no safe way for you to do a um, a nebulizer again unless you have a viral filter. So, you know, I, I you know, I don't I don't know. I, I couldn't picture a safe way for you to you know do a um, CPAP on a patient. Um, so there was some is a viral that, filter something that we're suddenly carrying on the ambulance. What is a viral filter? Of, um, well, I mean, I could try to put up a viral filter is like, so, okay, so you know, like all oxygen has what they call a 15, 22 millimeter connector, like the bag valve mask connecting on the endotracheal tube, that type of thing. It's a filter that clips on to there. So I could show you, I uh, just don't know how quick I'll be able to do it. I mean, it's nothing exciting. It's literally a disc. Um, Can you see my internet connection now, or you're still just seeing the uh, protocol? We're seeing the side of your head. Seeing the side of my head. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Again, those of you that are signing in with your phone, you're not going to be able to get CME credit because I can't see your name. Um, so give me a second here. Uh, Frank, I think some people are having problems getting in because I guess you made it a secure. So if their email wasn't in your distribution list, they can't get in. They should have the password and should be enough. Okay. Yeah, it's not taking it. It's saying they're unregistered. Well, the only people I that I sent the email to would be you, Zevian, and um, Yaakov. So everybody else who's hmm. in. I, I, didn't I, don't know what, I don't know why they're having problems in. Oh, hey, Jonathan. I had trouble signing in. It told me I needed some type of account or something like that. I don't even know how I ended up getting in. Yeah, a bunch of people getting, you're not authorized to attend the meeting. That. Okay. Well, the only reason I put some. Um, Frank, John and I are on the same one because we're on duty. Okay. Same to me. Okay, we'll, we'll figure it out then. Um, the only reason I had to make it a little secure was because of um, the. Um, the Zoom bombing that's going on, you know, where people are taking over the. Uh... It happened to my sister in the huh. middle of the class. She's a teacher. Really? Yeah. And so. it was like sexual things. It was really bad. Yeah. Okay. Um. So here we have our first test. Okay, can you see now the, the internet connection? Can you see yes. the yes. filter? So it's yes. basically just a filter that plugs in between the, well, the one we have has two ports. So it just connects between the bag valve mask. Oh, actually, no, this one would be like on your exhaust port, port of your bag valve mask. So, you know, the, the port on the, the part that curves down to where the mask is, there's an exhaust port. So this would this would clip onto that or it would be the end of the nebulizer. So when they exhale, their their you know, their exhalation air that's full of the virus would not be going in, you know, into the air that you're breathing in. So that's similar to the ninety fives. 
Uh, it is. It actually is an N95 filter in it. Yes. So that little white piece. Whoops. I don't know. It's scrolling around now. But that little white piece that was in it um, is actually a. Uh, here, let me see. I can bring it back. This little white piece that's inside here is actually a. Uh, you know, an N95 uh, filter. So. Okay. So any questions on anything that we've gone over so far? Okay. So let's do the actual. Um, the actual lecture. Okay. Let me just make sure that nobody is looking to get in. Okay. Okay, so can you see the uh, Hudson Valley Collaborative Protocol update for EMTBs? Can everybody see this? Somebody answer? Somebody? Yes. Amazing? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about how we treat um, you know, the main two cardiac emergencies that we face, you know, as EMTs and then the medications that we're going to use and stuff like that. After the class is over, I'm going to email out a link um, to the test. So I'll email it out to, again, to Chris, Yaakov, and Zevi, and then they'll just send it to everyone. And it's a 25-question uh, quiz slash exam. You can take it up to two times. You have to get a 70 or better on it. Um, if somebody can't pass it in two attempts, just let me know and I'll, you know, give you a third attempt on it. And then once you pass it with a 70 or better, it emails you and me a copy of the certificate that says, you know, you have two hours of CME in cardiac and one hour of CME in pharmacology. You keep yours for your records. I have it, you know, I have a copy for, for my records. And um, that's how you get your, you're going to be getting your CME. Okay, so... Um, but you have to take the test to be able to do it. And considering we have, you know, between 21 and 24 people fluctuating signing on, I, I think we have a much better success rate this way than we've had in a uh, classroom setting and stuff like that. Okay, and then you'll let me know how it goes, uh, you know, as we go on with the lecture and also with the test. Okay, so, you know, the, the difference between, you know, EMTs and people who learn first aid is the, that you have the ability to administer medication. So with that, ability has responsibility, right? Because we can hurt people with medications if we don't know the right reasons to give in and stuff like that. So before we ever give drugs, we have to make sure, obviously, the patient has no allergies to any medications, uh, especially the medication that we're going to be giving them. Are any of the medications that we administer as EMTs, is there a possibility for a patient to have an allergy to it? What do you think? Albuterol, nitroglycerin. Tylenol. Which tylenol. one? Tylenol. Tylenol. Yes. We don't. We don't give Tylenol. Uh, aspirin. Right? Aspirin. Is, nobody has allergies to aspirin. Aspirin. So aspirin is the right answer. So Tylenol and aspirin are two separate things. If you give a patient who's having a heart yeah. attack Tylenol, you are not going to help them whatsoever. So it has to be. All right, you got about me. I made a mistake. Non <laughs> non enterically coated chewable baby aspirin, right? So you, we got to make sure we have the right meds. So aspirin would probably be the only medication. Okay, that a patient could truly have an allergic reaction to. That's not to say that patients are going to tell you that they have an allergic reaction to nitroglycerin or they have allergic reaction to this. There's also a possibility people could say, you know, I took a medication like, say, albuterol, and I had an allergic reaction. Sometimes it's not the actual medication, but the preservatives in the medication. So, you know, again, you could ask them what, what exactly happened. So, you know, if they tell you that their heart raced, that's probably not an allergic reaction. If they tell you their lips were swelling and they had trouble breathing, that's more of an, uh, you know, an allergic reaction because their heart racing is a normal side effect of a drug like albuterol. Okay, now a lot of these other rights are really for nursing in a hospital, right? So right person, again, you know, a nurse goes into a room, there's more than one patient, so she needs to know which patient she's giving it to. For us, very rarely are we gonna have a situation where we have more than one patient that we're treating and we're gonna give them medications to. So that doesn't really, pertain to us. But, you know, if it, if it did happen, um, you know, in that situation, then, you know, obviously you have to know which patient needed the medication you're giving. Again, right drug, pretty rare we're giving multiple drugs. I mean, nowadays there's a possibility, I would say, that, you know, we could possibly give more than one drug. Um, you know, maybe in the chest pain patient, you know, we have aspirin, we have nitro, we have oxygen. The anaphylaxis now, besides um, the EpiPen, there's also albuterol treatments in there. The asthmatic, you can give albuterol. If you call medical control, you could also use the EpiPen if they're not getting better. And we'll talk about all that. So, you know, again, we, you know, there are multiple drugs, right? Dosing. So pretty much all the medication is prepackaged the way you need to give it. Uh, if you're doing check and inject, then obviously you need to know the medications to the right amount of the medications to draw up. And we'll go over that. And that is on a test to know the pediatric and adult doses of epinephrine. Okay. Um, the other one, obviously, you need to know how many aspirin to give. And we'll go over that. Okay. 
Um, right time is pretty much the time we're with the patient, right? Not like in the hospital where somebody may be taking medications, you know, on a, um, you know, on a regular basis, say every four hours, every eight hours and stuff like that. So for us, it's pretty much, um, you know, when, when we're with the patient and treating them. And obviously we wanna, as much as possible, not administer expired medications, okay? Um, you know, you do need to know the right routes to give medications, right? So, I mean, we need to know that nitroglycerin goes under the tongue, that they don't swallow it, um, and so on and so on. And we'll talk about all that. And then right documentation means what? That, you know, three months from now, when somebody reads that PCR, they should have no doubt figuring out why you gave a drug to a patient. So if you're giving albuterol to someone, there has to absolutely be that the patient was having trouble breathing and was wheezing, okay, or maybe coughing. Okay, if you're giving nitroglycerin to a patient, there absolutely has to be, you know, documentation the patient was having chest pain or chest pressure, you know, or something indicative of, you know, an angina or a heart attack. So you have to paint the picture of why you're giving it. So you can never give a medication unless you documented the need for the medication. Um, also, you want to document that the patient has no contraindications to the medication, right? That their blood pressure was adequate if it's nitroglycerin, that they haven't taken erectile dysfunction medications if it's nitroglycerin, and, you know, and so on. And then after, and, you know, probably pretty much a set of vital signs, the only medication that the protocol says that we don't have to get a set of vital signs or actually consent, it says, um, would be anaphylaxis. So if a patient's dying of anaphylaxis, and they can't talk to you, it's assumed that they're giving consent, right? That's implied consent because they're already at that point where they can't talk. And also that you don't have to get a set of vital signs because that's just delaying treatment in a life-threatening situation. But other than that, every other medication, you're supposed to get a set of vital signs and consent before you give it, okay? Um, the other documentation would be the patient's response to the medication, okay? probably a repeat set of vital signs. And if you're considering giving a second dose of the medication, then you need to clearly document why you're still giving a second dose. So, you know, if you're giving a second dose of albuterol, patient states they're feeling slightly better, but still has a wheeze. You know, if you're giving a second dose of nitroglycerin, the patient states chest pain still present. Um, you know, and then obviously if you're giving nitro, then you need to recheck their blood pressure and make sure that their systolic blood pressure is still over 120 millimeters of mercury uh, systolic, okay? Um, so again, some of you are signing on just with a phone number. So if there's a way that you could actually get your name to appear, that would be best as far as the, you know, credit for being here tonight. Okay, everybody at this point um, should be making their own account for Zoom. It doesn't cost you anything. And then you should be signing in via computer or if you have a smartphone, you can download the Zoom app to your smartphone and then you know, you basically just click on it and it opens up the uh, the invite and you sign on that way. And then you come up, you know, with your name and everything like that. Okay, so terminology wise, the indication is a reason why we give the medication. So obviously say bronchospasm, wheezing, trouble breathing would be an indication for albuterol. Chest pain would be an indication for nitroglycerin, for aspirin, and you know, so on. So an indication is a reason why we give it. A contraindication would be a reason why we would not give it. Okay, so if somebody told you, you know, uh, they, they took erectile dysfunction medications one hour ago in the midst of having sex with someone developed chest pain, then we really cannot give them nitroglycerin, okay? The action is what the medication does, and we'll talk about, you know, each one as we go over them, but like say, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, um, albuterol is a bronchodilator, so they basically, you know, nitro opens up the, the blood vessels, uh, albuterol opens up the bronchioles, the lung passageways to get more air in. Side effects are things that could happen when we give the medication. So a classic one we always talk about is the vasodilation of nitroglycerin is not limited to just the heart. So it does every blood vessel in the body. So if you give somebody nitroglycerin, you can bottom out their blood pressure and cause them to syncopize, right? And that, you know, basically faint. So what would you do in that situation? So you give somebody nitroglycerin, they say, oh my God, I feel like I'm gonna pass out and they, they pass out. So first thing is what? Make sure they're not actually dead. So I would lay them flat elevate their legs, check for a pulse, right? I, I always kind of lay them flat first because if you drop somebody's blood pressure low and you try to check for a pulse sitting up, they may not have a pulse just because they're sitting up. So, you know, lay them flat, elevate their legs, check for a pulse. If there's no pulse, obviously you killed them. So now you need to start CPR, okay? Um, and then from there, you would go on. You know, you'd probably want to get them on some oxygen if they do have a pulse, okay? Get a repeat set of vital signs so you see what went wrong and, you know, figure out what to do. But remember, really, initially, your management would be, you know, you're going to try to stabilize that patient. Don't get on the radio and start screaming for ALS until you start actually managing the patient, right? I mean, do what you need to do to, to make sure whether or not, you know, there's something that you could actually do to help the patient, okay? 
Um, and therapeutic level refers to that you have to have a certain amount of the drug on board before it does something, right? So let's say you give somebody an albuterol treatment, they say, oh, they only feel a little better, but now you give them a second albuterol treatment, they feel 100% better. So it just meant that you had to get enough of the drug on board to do what it needed to do, just like nitro. Maybe the first dose doesn't work, but the second dose works. You know, aspirin, why do we give a certain amount of aspirin? Because, you know, if we only gave one aspirin, we would never have a therapeutic level in the blood. So we have to give multiple, you know, aspirins to be able to get that therapeutic level on board to be able to help that patient. Um, somebody had a chat thing, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, so some people are just telling me they don't have computer or smartphone access. Okay, but you gotta get in with the 20th century here, so. Because this is the way that uh, CME is gonna be done, you know, probably in the future. The state is making a whole, you know, um, online training platform that you, uh, you're you gonna be able to access. Okay, so you're gonna have to have the right tools to be able to access it. Maybe, again, if it's a, you know, a situation, maybe the ambulance corps can put a, uh, you know, a computer in the, the building so you'll be able to access it. Okay, um, okay, so let's talk about some different cardiac problems. So we have angina pectoris, right, which means literally pain in the chest, right, angina is pain, pectoris is your chest, okay, and um, acute myocardial infarction, which is the fancy term for a heart attack, right? So acute means sudden, myo is muscle, cardio is heart, so that's heart muscle, myocardial, and infarction means death of. So we would like to get them before their heart infarcts, right? So we give them oxygen, we give them aspirin, and we try to prevent their muscle from dying. So we try to keep it in what's called the ischemic stage. Okay, now, both of these conditions are brought on by what we call a disease called coronary artery disease, CAD, coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease is that because of the way we eat, which is tends to be fatty foods, we coat the inside of our arteries, okay, with fat. Now, since we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the coronary arteries, which run along the surface of the heart. They give the heart the oxygen they need to be able to beat, right? That's what allows the, the heart muscle to squeeze. So the coronary arteries are small, okay? You know, you really need, you know, magnifying glasses on to be able to work on them, okay? And they, inside of them now, it starts to become coated with fat, okay? And let me just, I'll bring you to a picture of what this looks like. And then we'll go back. Okay, so over here, right, this is the inside of the coronary artery, obviously greatly blown up, okay? And there's a fat deposit on the inside of it. Now, this starts out very small, and then over the years, okay, it gets thicker and thicker. And this could happen in multiple places in multiple arteries, it could happen in your brain, it could happen anywhere, okay? But, you know, it starts to stick. Um, they know because of autopsies they've done on young soldiers, okay, that this happens very early in life because of our fatty food diet that we have, okay? Now, the body never um, lets something stay inside your body that doesn't belong there without trying to cover it up. So if you notice on this slide that it's getting like a coating on top of it, and that's called a fibrous cap. So the fat's there and the body grows a cap over it. And your likelihood of having a heart attack relates to how thick the cap is. If it's a very thin cap like this is, that cap can rupture and trigger what's called a, a thrombotic rupture. And I'll talk about that in a second. If the cap is very thick, it's not likely to rupture. Now, I know it doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense because if the cap was very thick, it would further narrow the area the blood has to go through. But that's the way it is. The thinner your cap, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. Okay, now, this concept of something getting stuck in an artery, okay, that's been there, you know, it's there for a while, it didn't float from somewhere else, is called a thrombus, okay? Um, T-H-R-O-M-B-U-S, thrombus, okay? Something that breaks free and then travels somewhere else in the body is called an embolism or embolic. So most heart attacks, and this is a quest, test question, most heart attacks are what they call thrombotic events, where the thrombus, this, this fat is called a thrombus ruptures. Okay, and I'm gonna tell you what happens. Where most strokes are what they call embolic events, which means that a blood clot, okay, breaks loose and goes up to your brain. Or say a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the blood vessels going to your lung. Most pulmonary embolisms are a blood clot that breaks in your leg, right? It's called a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, thrombosis that breaks loose in your leg and floats up, okay, up into the right side of your heart and the right side of your heart, you know, is pumps to your lungs. So it gets stuck in the pulmonary artery going to your lung and causes you to feel short of breath because you can't get any blood to the lungs, okay? So those are all embolic events, but most heart attacks are thrombotic events. 
So what basically happens is that, you know, person, this takes years to develop, okay? And, you know, all of a sudden now the, the cap ruptures. Now what causes the cap to rupture would be high blood pressure. But the main cause of cap rupture is stressful environments. Now it doesn't have to be just psychological stress. Okay, it could be that you're exerting yourself like shoveling the snow. Um, it could be just physical stress. It could be the stress of illness. And what happens is whenever we're stressed, there's a different substances that are secreted, okay? And one of these substances, okay, cortisol, okay, eats away at that cap and can cause it to rupture, okay? But high blood pressure could also do it just by eroding it. Now, as soon as the cap ruptures, the body thinks it's a cut for some reason, right? Thinks that little, that little break in the fat is a wound. And we know already that the substance is sent to, you know, to cuts, to wounds or platelets. So the platelets start to, and they're floating the blood all the time, just waiting to be activated. So they get stuck, okay? And they go there and start sticking and they basically stick on each other. That's called clumping or sticking together, aggregation it's called. They start sticking and they seal off the wound, but by sealing off the wound, they actually seal off the artery. Okay. So it's pretty rare where somebody's going to, you know, have a heart attack where they grab their chest and just die instantaneously. It happens, but it's rare. Most people, it takes about, you know, 30 minutes to a couple of hours for the, for that platelet clumping to start sealing off that artery and, you know, causing them to get a lot of chest pain. Now, what's the chest pain caused by, right? So when you don't get enough oxygen, okay, to a muscle, if, let's say you're exercising right now, you don't get enough muscle oxygen to the muscle your metabolism, the way you make energy changes from what's called aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. So when you make energy with oxygen and sugar, that's called aerobic metabolism. And when you make it with not enough oxygen, okay, it's called anaerobic metabolism. So like an AN in front of the word aerobic. So it means without. And what happens is that when you make it without enough oxygen, you have a, well, one, you don't make as much energy, but the, the bigger product is that the waste, waste, the bigger problem that is the waste product is, is not oxygen and, C, in oxygen and water, like when you make it with enough oxygen, because that we can get rid of. We can breathe out the CO2 and we can urinate out the water, or actually we reuse most of the water, okay? But when you do it with anaerobic metabolism without enough oxygen, the byproduct is lactic acid. And if you've ever like tried to, I don't know, put a light bulb in where your arm was above your head and your arm started trembling, you know, and, and shaking and you felt weak or you get a burn, like you're walking real fast, you get a burn in your leg or burn in your side, that is lactic acid, okay? That's because you were using that muscle too much and it wasn't getting enough oxygenated blood. In a heart attack, it's the same lactic acid that's causing the pain, okay? But there, it's because the artery is blocked. So they're not going to be, become pain-free until that artery is reopened. And we know that really nowadays, the only way to reopen that artery, okay, is with angioplasty. So when, you know, they have to get to the hospital to have that area ballooned and stented open. Okay, so let me go back. So we were over here now, okay. So both of those are caused by that coronary artery disease. In the heart attack, it's where it ruptures. In the angina, it's the, the, the fat, that was there, plus there's some calcium that inf infiltrates the wall of the artery. So if calcium works its way into the wall of the artery, it doesn't allow the artery to dilate. And if you were deciding to get up right now and start running around, you would need arteries to dilate or open up so they can get move around more oxygenated blood so you could keep your you know, muscles nourished and your heart is a muscle. So an angina typically happens in older people, and it's a combination of a narrowing of the inside of the artery and a stiffening of the artery. That's why it used to be called hardening of the arteries. And that combination does not allow enough oxygenated blood to get to the heart when there's exertion, right? So what does that mean? Typically in angina, the person is going to say to you, I was running, or I was walking, or I was shoveling snow, or I was having an argument. And all of a sudden, I got this chest pain. But as soon as I stopped doing that, the chest pain started to get less, right? That's the more typical angina type of situation. The person who's having a heart attack, typically the pain comes on at rest, usually earlier in the day than later in the day. A lot of times wakes them up or at the time of waking up. And that's just because that the highest levels of those hormones are early in the morning in our body. So those hormones that tend to cause the, the fibrous cap over the fat to rupture tend to be highest in the morning, okay? And that's why it happens. Not all the time. I mean, you know, we, we've had heart attacks all throughout the day, but most heart attacks you go to are before lunchtime, you know, most of the time. Okay. Now, somebody who's having angina, it's a temporary 
they call episodic. There's an episode of the pain. And as soon as they reverse what they're doing, the pain goes away. Okay. Now, once they have that diagnosis of angina, they usually go for a stress test. While they're doing the stress test, they get chest pain. And, you know, they then usually get a cardiac catheterization. They look at their arteries. And if there's no great clogs anywhere that they have to balloon open, they tell them, okay, you have angina now. You know, avoid very stressful activities. And if you do have chest pain, here's a prescription for nitroglycerin. And if that pain occurs, you put one tablet under your tongue, let it dilate. Okay, if that doesn't work, you do it a second time. If that doesn't work, you do it a third time, which is, you know, what the patient's told, and we do the same thing. The only thing is we have a couple more things we have to check out for, right? We have to make sure they have a systolic blood pressure over 120. They haven't taken ED medications in a while. Um, just about the ED medications, you know, those of you that uh, did the online protocol update, you know, one of the questions said that you don't have to worry about ED medications anymore. So, you know, that's totally wrong. I, I sent an email to the state told them, telling them it was totally wrong. They consulted with their medical directors, and that is back into effect where you have to check for, you know, whether or not a patient took ED medications or not. So that was a mistake on whoever put that presentation together. They were, you know, incorrect. Um, but, um, you know, with, a, with angina, okay, really, probably before we even get there, their pain should start diminishing, right? So if their pain was a nine out of 10, when they called us, if they sat down, okay, and reversed the precipitating factors that brought it on, in other words, they're not shoveling snow anymore, that pain should start to get less. Sometimes it doesn't because they get scared. And obviously when you get scared, you have adrenaline released. And when you have adrenaline released, your heart works harder, but their pain should start getting less. And then if the police show up and put them on oxygen, their pain should start getting less. And if we show up and continue the oxygen, relax them and assist them with their nitroglycerin, okay, then their pain should start, you know, going away because nitroglycerin, again, is a smooth muscle relaxant. So it opens up those arteries and gets more blood to the heart, okay? Um, just a couple of things about this coronary artery disease that's interesting, right? So again, it's a slow, very progressive thing that takes years to develop, okay, and really only gets terrible in people in their 60s and 70s and so on. Now, you've all heard about the 30-year-old guy who has a heart attack and dies or has a horrible outcome, you know, and has a big infarct and, you know, is a cripple and stuff like that and needs oxygen for the rest of their lives. But yet you've also heard about the 70-year-old who says they've had six heart attacks and some of them they didn't even know about. So why is the young person who should be otherwise healthier than the older person suffering so bad? And, you know, why is the older person getting away with it? So the way the body works is it, it always tries to fix things that we screw up. So we, we ate poorly and we narrowed coronary arteries, okay? And again, we said it took decades. We were 60, 70 years old. It took decades for that. So the body started to sense that there wasn't enough blood getting to certain parts of the heart. And what does it do? It doesn't penalize us and say, you know, Frank ate like a pig and now you're going to die. What does it do? It says, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance and I'm going to start growing new arteries in that area where you don't, you're not getting enough blood. And that's called collateral, like collateral of a loan when you put money down, you know, where you have something up on a, a loan. So collateral circulation. So it means that in the area where there was a lot of coronary artery disease and the arteries were narrowed, it actually starts to grow new blood vessels in that area. Now, the problem is it doesn't happen when you're in your 20s and 30s, right? It only starts to happen in, say, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So those people that are younger don't have that collateral circulation. So now they block a vessel. They have a heart attack. They block a vessel off. That's it. You're 20 years old. You block a vessel off. That's the only vessel in that area of the heart. You have a big infarct. When you're 60 years old or 70 or 80 years old, okay, and you block that vessel off or you narrow that vessel, you have a couple other vessels that have now grown in the same area, so you still get some blood to that area and you don't tend to have a big infarct. Okay, so that's the difference between those two. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far on what we were talking about? Okay, so what do we ask? Okay, so remember, somebody could have chest pain, they could have chest pressure, they could just say like, there's an elephant sitting in my chest, there's a belt squeezing me, any of those types of things where we you know, consider it to be uh, chest pain. What's not so typical is the pain radiating into an arm as much as they tell us it is. It's more typical for us to, for the, you know, them to tell us it's ra uh, radiating to their neck or their jaw or their back. Okay. But the arm doesn't seem to be as typical. Okay. Now, some people talk about stomach aches more than chest pain, and that's the inferior wall MI. So when we talk about heart attacks, right, we talk about the area of the heart that's damaged and they classify by the wall of the heart. So your front wall is your anterior wall, your back wall is your posterior wall, 
your side wall is your lateral wall, and the bottom wall right above your belly is your inferior wall. And when you have an inferior wall MI, okay, uh, Shlomi just is joining us, late as usual. Okay, when you have a inferior wall MI, since it's sitting right above your belly, you tend to have more GI complaints. Okay, and that's for some reason slightly more statistically possible in women, right, to have um, inferior wall MIs. So, you know, but again, somebody who says, you know, I have a abdominal pain, but they yet look like they're having a heart attack. They have cool pale skin. You know, they look a little sicker than someone who just has a stomach ache. Um, it could always be that inferior wall of mine. Okay. Then we want to ask the OPQRS questions, onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time. So onset is what? Um, you know, what were you doing when it happened? Or, you know, when, what time was it when it happened? Provocation, does anything make it better or worse? Okay. Quality, can you describe the pain? So don't give them any adjectives. Let them describe, you know, is it sharp pain, dull pain, pressure, you know, whatever it's going to, whatever they're going to describe it as. Radiation, does it go any place other than your chest, right? Does it travel anywhere? Severity on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst, how bad's the pain? And we always reassess that whenever we add any intervention to the, to the patient. Okay, hold on one second. Hello? Okay, um, on a conference call, is it really important? Okay, no problem. Sorry. Okay. Um, so again, severity scale of one to ten, and then whatever you do for the patient, you would, um, you know, what you would reassess. Uh, hold on. So we just had a chat. Oh, Shlaimi. Okay, I believe you. Not really, but. Okay. Um, okay. So, and then time would be how long it's uh, it's been going on and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, dyspnea is obviously the medical term for shortness of breath. Okay. And let me just see why it's not doing what it usually does. Okay. Okay. Orthopnea is shortness of breath positional. Right, so in other words, people who have congestive heart failure and they have fluid in their lungs tend to have more trouble breathing when they're lying flat. So that would be orthopnea. Diaphoresis is the cold sweat, which is never normal to see in someone, right? People should sweat because they're hot. A cold sweat always means that their sympathetic nervous system, their emergency nervous system was activated. So somebody who's scared because they think they're having a heart attack would right. have cold sweat. Yep. I don't see the slide. You don't see the slides? Anybody else not see the slides? No, they're no, gone. We're no, just seeing the top of your head again. Nope. Yeah, looks like you turned off your uh, share. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Better? No. No. Nope. See you. Nope. Okay, hold on. There you go. Okay. 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 Uh, sorry. Okay. So restlessness or anxiety, right? So people having heart attacks are scared. Okay. And the same thing like that feeling for impending doom, right? Some people know when they're going to die. Some people are just hypochondriacs, but you know, some people do know. If you have a patient who really, you sense like they're literally dying in front of you, um, is if they're still conscious, you can encourage them to cough, forcefully cough. And it actually generates a little pressure in their chest and pumps a little more blood. If they actually close their eyes and die in front of you, then just haul back and give them what we call a precordial thump, which is punch them dead center between your nipple line, um, you know, hard. And that's the equivalent of a quick defibrillation. And sometimes that will actually, because you're doing it the minute they went into V-fib, um, may actually convert it. Okay, so, you know, that's something you could try. Um, and you only do it once, right? So you don't beat them to death. It doesn't look good in front of the family. Okay, nausea, vomiting, very common of the inferior wall MI that we talked about before with the abdominal discomfort. And in elderly patients, okay, because their nerve endings are starting, also diabetics, because their nerve endings are starting to fail, they don't feel chest pain the same way. So a lot of times in an elderly patient, the main complaint is um, fatigue, tiredness. You know, I just feel like I have no energy and stuff, okay? And palpitations would be that they feel like their heart is racing. Okay, so what do we do for them? Make them comfortable, right? Because the more comfortable they are, reassure them, the less adrenaline is being secreted. And if you're having a heart attack, the last thing you want is adrenaline secreted because it's going to make your heart work harder. Okay, now oxygen. So we know that we're titrating our oxygen to 
you know, that you want a, to give them, you want their pulse ox to be 94% or better. Okay. So if their pulse ox is already 94, 95%, technically they don't need any additional oxygen. Um, I would not fault anybody for putting them on a nasal cannula at a liter or two, you know, even if they're sat in at 94, 95, but you know, um, they don't need, definitely do not need a non-rebreather face mask at that point. Okay. So if they're below 94%, then I would put them on a nasal cannula at two liters. If that doesn't improve it, you know, uh, four liters. If that doesn't improve it, six liters. And if you're at six liters and you're not getting a uh, oxygen saturation above 94%, then switch them to a non-rebreather. You're gonna ask them if they have any allergies to aspirin, okay? And then if they have none, you need to give them four, what they call non-enterically coated, okay? Which means there's no hard coating on it. Chewable baby aspirin. Okay, so 81 milligram is baby aspirin, 325 is adult aspirin, but you're going to give them 481 milligram. Okay. The reason we don't just give them one big 324 is all the 324s, or it actually says 325 on them, are coated, right? They have a hard coating on them. So you want to give them the ones that are uncoated so it goes to work right away. So by them chewing it and swallowing it, it goes to work immediately. If they just swallow a coated one, it's going to take probably somewhere before an hour before it starts to kick in and two or three hours before the level reaches, you know, a level, a therapeutic level where it'd be helpful. Okay. And in new protocol, it specifically says that if a patient took aspirin before you got there, okay, typically we wouldn't give them our aspirin, but if you have any doubt that the aspirin was good, or if you have any doubt that the patient took the aspirin the right way, let's say they, they, swallowed it or they took expired 10 year old aspirin or something like that you're allowed to give them a second dose of your aspirin and that's because the dose of aspirin that we're giving them at 324 milligrams is half the dose that someone would have taken for a headache when we used aspirin for headaches and toothaches and you know stuff that nowadays we use Tylenol for Okay, so you're not giving them a very high dose by giving them 324 milligrams so you shouldn't fear that if they didn't take it the right way you know, to, to give them another dose. But if they took it the right way or you gave them one dose already, for most of us, 324 milligrams is an adequate dose to do what it needs to do. So there's no reason to give them um, more, okay? So aspirin is the number one most important thing. Remember, make sure they don't have anaphylaxis to it. Now, some other things that patients may say to you with aspirin, right, is that, that they could say, my doctor told me not to take aspirin. And that is because they were taking aspirin for arthritic pain, right? They had arthritis. They were taking aspirin. This is, you know, going back 10, 15, 20 years ago, they were taking aspirin for arthritic pain and it caused them to have stomach problems. Their stomach hurt. They had some bleeding and so on. Doctor told them you can't take aspirin anymore. So the, basically, if that's the case, right, you, you kind of say to them, why did your doctor talk, not tell you not to take aspirin? And they say, oh, you know, caused some bleeding or made my stomach not feel good. You could say to them that, you know, in this situation where if, God forbid, you're having a heart attack, the aspirin will be very, very helpful to you, okay? We'd like to give it to you because it would really be a benefit and it's not going to cause your stomach to start bleeding because you're only taking one small dose. If they say no, then you just document that you tried to give the patient aspirin, they refused, okay? And they'll get it, they'll get it guaranteed in the hospital, but um, you, know, you could just document that to them, okay? Um, and again, the other question people ask is, you know, what about if they have a GI bleed, right? They have a, ga a gastrointestinal and a stomach bleed right now while they're having a heart attack. So could that happen? Yes. But I've been doing this, you know, 35 years and I have not met somebody who's having a heart attack and a GI bleed at the same time. So is it possible? Yes. Is it likely to happen? No. So if they're actually having a heart attack and a GI bleed, one, I would wonder if they're really having a heart attack. In other words, if they have more abdominal complaints, maybe it's just their bleed not their actual heart, but I, in that case, call medical control and say what they want to do. More than likely, they will tell you to withhold the aspirin. The other thing people ask about aspirin is if somebody's on an aspirin every day, do they still need to get aspirin? The answer is yes, because they were only taking 81 milligrams and they probably took it in the morning when they woke up. And now they're having a heart attack at three o'clock in the afternoon and they do not have a therapeutic level of the aspirin on board. So yes, you have to give it to them. Uh, people ask about blood thinners and different other medications patients may be taking. The, asp the answer is yes, you still give it to them because an aspirin interferes with platelets, okay? And there's very few other medications that interfere with platelets the way aspirin does. Now, there are some drugs out there like Plavix and stuff that do the similar thing. Um, but the feeling is that the patient would benefit from the aspirin, so you would still give it to them. Okay, so any questions on the oxygen, any questions on the aspirin in the heart attack patient? Okay, now the, eat the nitroglycerin. 
So first of all, we know that we're only, we're, we don't carry nitroglycerin on BLS ambulances. So the only patient that you're gonna have the opportunity to give nitroglycerin to or assist a patient with taking nitroglycerin would be somebody who has a previous diagnosis of angina and was prescribed nitroglycerin you know, by their doctor, right? So you're only giving it to a patient who has a prescription for nitroglycerin and has the nitroglycerin on them. Okay, so what are the precautions is, you know, one that we wanna make sure they're not taking any of the ED medications. So that's the Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, okay? And the state says for 72 hours, which is a pretty long window um, for it. Okay, most people would say eight to 24 hours, but that's what the state put into the BLS protocol. Um, and the reason why is that ED medications cause vasodilation, which is what allows a man to get an erection. And so does nitroglycerin. So you have two drugs that do the same thing. In fact, ED medications were originally uh, being studied as blood pressure medications to lower blood pressure by vasodilation. And they found as a side effect that when uh, male test subjects took it, they got an erection. Um, I shouldn't say they got an erection, but if they were uh, aroused, they got an erection, right? Because uh, these ED medications don't cause you to have an immediate erection. You have to be aroused, and then it just allows you to have a better erection, I guess would be the right term. So they found that these guys were, you know, getting a better erection. So some very smart marketing person realized that there's more than enough blood pressure medications out there, but there was no medication that does that. And they then changed the marketing of it to erectile dysfunction. And, you know, the rest is history. It's the largest moneymaker uh, ever of pharmaceuticals uh, was uh, Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra. Now, um, we would think that we Frank, would have to, yes. What about, beta, what about beta blockers? Wouldn't they have the same contraindication? So we'll talk about beta blockers and alpha blockers. Yep, we're going to talk about those. Very good question, okay. But let's just go back. The, the medications, right, the ED medications, you would think that you only have to ask to male patients, right? So here's the deal. Yes, only men will take Viagra, Cialis, and Vitra, but the active ingredient in those medications is called Sedelafil. And that medication is being used to treat other conditions. And the two main conditions is being used to treat is something called uh, BPH, which is a, um, a large prostate uh, gland in a man. So they, they have problems urinating, okay? Um, and then also something called pulmonary, like long pulmonary hypertension, like high blood pressure. Now it's high blood pressure in the arteries going from the right side of the heart to the lungs. And if the pressure is high going from the right side of the heart to the lungs, it's hard for the heart to pump the deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get oxygen. So therefore the patient is chronically short of breath. Now, the main people that have pulmonary hypertension would be COPDers, okay? Uh, people, sometimes people have other lung diseases would also have it. And very rarely it happens in, for, for no reason. And sometimes it happens in like young, healthy women for no reason, uh, sometimes after pregnancy. And that's called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So just all of a sudden they start getting short of breath and nobody understands why. And they go for testing and find out that they've just all of a sudden get high blood pressure in that specific set of arteries. So they found these medications because they promote vasodilation actually makes it easier to pump blood through those blood vessels to the lungs. Now it's not called Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra. It's called Revideo, uh, like with R-E-V-A-T-I-O or something like that. So, I, and I don't know, there may even be other names, but what I would say is that before you give somebody nitroglycerin, you wanna make sure their blood pressure is over 120 systolic, that they haven't taken Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, okay? And you would wanna find out, do they have a history, if it's a man, of BPH? Okay. And also, if it's a woman, do they have a history? Well, man or woman actually could have uh, pulmonary hypertension. So do they have a history of pulmonary hypertension? And if that's, if they have any of that, then I would not give them the nitro. And then I'll talk about a little bit what Lisa was talking about, the medications that can also interact with it in a second. Okay. So EMTs are allowed to assist the patient in taking their nitroglycerin which means up to and including you giving, giving it to them if they can't figure out how to do it themselves, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to put the nitro in their hands or between their fingers, but if they're able to take it themselves, you would assist them in taking it, but if they can't take it themselves, you could actually give it to them. Remember, it's a sublingual medication, which means that you're putting it under the tongue. It comes packaged two ways, little white tablets that would just dissolve. One tablet under the tongue, it just dissolves, okay? or a spray, and one spray is equivalent to one tablet that you spray under the tongue. Now, sometimes older patients have a hard time lifting their tongue up, right? So the easiest thing to do is, again, you have gloves on, get a four by four, and with the four by four, grab their tongue and lift it up. And the other reason using a four by four is it's the only thing that you, if you try to grab it with your uh, gloves, you'll just slip off. So you just use the four by four to, uh, to grab it, to lift it up out of the way. Your dentist 
um, probably did that or should be doing that when you go for your checkups because they should be looking for uh, what they call buccal uh, cancer, cancer in the gum or under the tongue, especially if you, um, what's that word with the tobacco, chew tobacco, right? Those people who chew tobacco or even if you smoke or vape have a higher incidence of having cancer in their tongue and under the tongue and their, their gums and stuff like that. So they should be doing that for you uh, pretty routinely now. Okay, we're allowed to give up to three doses, five minutes apart, as long as the patient's blood pressure stays above 120 systolic. And obviously that means that after the first dose, they're still having chest pain. It didn't go away. So you check their blood pressure. As long as it's above uh, 120 systolic, you give them a second and up to three doses. Um, how do we know the nitroglycerin is still good? So the white tablets do not last long. The spray does last long. So if you're using the white tablets, is a chance that they may not actually be potent anymore and work. So whenever you give somebody nitro and you put it under your tongue, um, usually they'll feel a little like tingling or burning sensation under the tongue, the tablet wise. The spray doesn't often do that, but it could, okay? But pretty much everybody who gets nitro gets a little bit of a headache. Some people get a severe headache, some people get a mild headache. That's from the drop in blood pressure. So if you give somebody nitro and they don't feel any tingling and they don't get a headache, you kind of question whether nitro is still good or not, okay? Um, again, we say we're going to recheck the patient's blood pressure and stuff like that. And since you, it is a possibility that you're treating a heart attack patient, they have to go to an angioplasty center. Now, right now in Rockland, Good Sam is the only one, but very shortly, probably, well, it might be delayed because of the COVID, but you know, probably summertime or definitely by the end of 2020, NIAC will also be an angioplasty center. And I'm sure they'll do a whole full court press to let everybody know once that, uh, once that happens. Okay, now questions on aspirin, right? So aspirin on a test prevents platelet aggregation or clumping, which means it prevents the platelets from sticking together when you have that thrombotic rupture of the fat, right? So the thrombotic rupture is the indication of, you know, why you would give it and stuff like that. Okay, contraindication would be allergies to aspirin. Okay, salicylates is the medical term for aspirin, okay? Or a history of an active GI bleed at the time you want to treat them, okay? Again, we talked about the platelet clumping, so it interferes with the platelet clumping um, and stops the platelets from sticking together. So if I had a sudden onset of chest pain right now and I chewed for baby aspirin, okay, my blockage in my artery would probably be a bit pretty minimal. If I wait 30 minutes and then take the aspirin, whatever clumping occurred until I took the aspirin occurred because the aspirin will not unclump things. It will stop new blockage, but it will not unclump things. So if somebody waits three hours, then they have a significant blockage. If somebody gets that aspirin in the first five minutes, they have minimal blockage. That's why really all of us should have baby aspirin at home if God forbid, you know, us or one of our loved ones, you know, develops chest, uh, chest discomfort, okay? And if you only have the coated ones, then you just chew them up as best you can, grind them up between your teeth, um, you know, as best, uh, as best you can. Okay, so... We know that uh, aspirin goes orally, right? You're swallowing it. The dose, the New York State Protocol dose is 481 milligram chewable aspirin, okay? Again, whoops, that's it for aspirin. Okay, so any questions on aspirin? Okay, so nitroglycerin. So we talked about when we would use it, how we would use it and stuff like that, right? It's a smooth muscle relaxant. Okay, so it actually relaxes every smooth muscle in your body. So you have smooth muscle in your arteries, your uh, gastrointestinal tract, so your, your intestine and stomach and your bronchioles. So if you give somebody nitroglycerin and they had a stomach ache, it'd probably make it feel better. If you gave somebody who was having some trouble breathing nitroglycerin, it actually probably would make it feel better. The reason we don't use it in those situations is that it can drop the blood pressure, okay? The indication to give it is somebody who's having, in our case, it would be somebody who's having uh, chest pain typical to their angina pain. So remember, angina pain is exertional. Exertion means you're exerting yourself, right? It's exertional chest pain, okay? The contraindication would be allergies to nitroglycerin, which again, I've never heard about, but people may say they have it, okay? Again, it could be the preservatives and stuff like that. Blood pressure below 120 systolic. I put the suspected inferior wall MI. So if you remember, the inferior wall MI was the person who had the infarct on the wall of the heart sitting above the belly, right? And we said that's more typical in women, okay? And they have more GI complaints. So if somebody, you know, if you go there and somebody says, my stomach's bothering me, but you're kind of leaning towards their heart, I would wait for the medics to show up before you give them the nitroglycerin because they need to do 12 lead to rule out whether or not it's an inferior wall MI, okay? The contraindications, again, any erectile dysfunction medication use in the last 72 hours, okay? Um, that they were being treated for BPH, right? Benign prostatic uh, hyper hyperplasia, 
okay? Um, now, this is what Lisa was talking about before. There are beta blockers and alpha blockers. Beta blockers tend to end, end in LOL or AL medications, okay? They slow, they lower the blood pressure by slowing the pumping action of the heart. And alpha blockers, okay, tend to lower the blood pressure by relaxing the blood vessels. So we're not as concerned with beta blockers and nitroglycerin, but if somebody has a low blood pressure to start with, because of the beta blocker, you'd be excluded from giving the nitro anyway, because if their blood pressure is below 120, you can't give it, okay? Now, the only reason we're a little concerned about the alpha blockers is they're being, they, be, they are used to treat BPH. And if you see, the, probably the number one, you probably all written this down at some point, is Flomax, right? So, so Flomax is the number one probably prescribed medication for BPH. So if somebody has BPH, and again, I don't expect you to remember all the different names of the medications or anything like that, but if somebody has BPH, um, probably should withhold the nitroglycerin. Now, if their blood pressure is very high, you know, I don't know, you know, 160, 170, I wouldn't fear it. But if their blood pressure is, you know, close to 120, say 120, 130, I would stay away from it, or at least wait for the paramedics to come um, you know, that way. Okay. Again, up to three doses, five minutes apart, as long as the chest pain continues and you recheck the blood pressure. Okay. And uh, the route is sublingual under the tongue. Okay. Okay. So any questions on the heart attack patient, the angina patient, the nitroglycerin, the aspirin, the oxygen, anything like that? Any questions? Okay, we'll spend another five minutes on asthma and then uh, I'll let everybody go. Like I said, after the test is done, um, I'm sorry, after the lecture is done, I will email out the link to Yaakov, to Chris and to um, Zevi, and then they'll send it out to everyone. At some point I'll get an email list of everyone. Actually, um, if you signed into Zoom via your email, I'll have everybody's email addresses at some point, okay? Um, the other thing I'm going to do is that once we finish the recording, I will upload it um, to a YouTube channel, and I'll send out a link to, you know, to everyone uh, via, via Yaakov, uh, Chris, and uh, Zevi. So if you want to review it or anything like that. And I'll also send them the PowerPoints from tonight's lecture if you, you know, want to have the PowerPoints to go over. Okay. So, um, and again, you have to take the test to get the CME credit. Right, so until you take the test and pass the test with a 70 or better, you're not going to have any uh, any credit. Okay, so what's asthma? Asthma is another episodic disease. Like angina was episodic. It's, you don't have it all the time. It happens and comes and goes. Asthma is the same thing. So you do have asthma all the time, but most of the times you're fine. And then you do something to aggravate your asthma. And typically they call the things that aggravate asthma triggers, like the trigger on a gun. And there can be many different types of triggers, and we'll talk about that. But when they, when it's, uh, it's called hyperactive airway disease, when you overstimulate your airways if, and you're an asthmatic, okay, what happens? So the first thing is that we said that the airway is lined with smooth muscle, just like the arteries are. So they contract and get tighter, okay? They, the mucus that lines them, okay, gets swells and you can get what's called mucus plugging. Now, mucus plugging means that the mucus that we have from our nose down to our bronchioles and our alveoli and all that stuff, it's designed to catch dust and pollution, and you know you have hairs lining your airway that wave towards your nose, right? So they take that mucus and are constantly bringing it up to your nose to get all that pollution out of your, your respiratory system. Now, if you put somebody on dry oxygen, this is like you know when you wake up and your nose is all dried or when you're sick and your nose is all dried out, if you're giving somebody dry oxygen, so the oxygen in an oxygen tank is dry, it has zero humidity. So if you're giving a respiratory patient, an asthmatic patient, non-humidified oxygen, right? So to humidify oxygen, we have to put it through a device called the humidifier, which every ambulance should have, okay? But if we give them non-humidified oxygen, we're gonna make their asthma worse. So think about in the hospital, when you went to visit somebody in the hospital, no patient in the hospital is ever on oxygen without it going through a humidifier, which is just a bottle of water. So EMS, we tend not to do it, especially in Rockland County. And we argue that we have such short transport times. And really, I mean, to be honest with you, if you wanted to 100% take care of your patients the right way, the patient should be on humidified oxygen. Now there's no way to give them humidified oxygen in the house because the humidifier will not work well in a portable bottle, a portable regulator. But once you're in the ambulance, you can do it. They're, they're one-time use disposable. You should not 
use it from patient to patient, obviously, for disease spreading and bacteria buildup and stuff like that. And they're pretty cheap. I think they're like seven bucks a, you know, a, a bottle. So it's not a huge cost. Now, the danger of mucus plugging is this. So if you look at this uh, picture up here, upper left, this is a uh, bronchial that's dissected open. And these were the alveoli over here. Um, but it's dissected open. And can you see this white stuff in here? So that's a mucus plug, right? Basically, this person, who knows what they had, asthma, cystic fibrosis, or whatever, it basically clogged that airway. So it's just like having an obstructed airway. They couldn't breathe in this section of their lung because of that. Same thing over here. Okay. Now, obviously, since you're looking at dissected lungs, you're obviously looking at lungs of dead people. So these are people that did not survive, you know, whatever their episode was. And I'm sure the mucus plugging had some, um, you know, had some cause to it or something like that. Okay. The, um, this one is a large mucus plug that was dissected out of somebody's um, bronchioles. Hold on one second. What's up? Okay, I'll call you back. Okay. Um, so again, the, the, the whole purpose of this part is, you know, put them on humidified oxygen, especially kids, especially respiratory patients. Um, if they're a congestive heart failure patient where they have water in their lungs, they don't need it. But asthma, COPD, they all need uh, humidified oxygen. They'll, they'll definitely do uh, better overall with uh, humidified oxygen. Okay, so triggers could be allergies, infection, stress. I've seen barbecue smoke, uh, cigarette smoke, um, seasonal temperature allergies, pollen, you know, like when it first gets hot and humid, you know, you get a lot of it and stuff like that. So anything could be a trigger. Asthmatics can have more than one trigger. Their triggers can change from year to year. Okay. The classic sign and symptom of asthma is wheezing. Okay. So that's the bronchial constriction. It's the equivalent of when you put your fingers in your mouth and you blow air through them and you make a whistling sound. It's the exact thing. So you're blowing air through a narrowed, you know, structure by blowing it through your fingers. It's the same thing when you're trying to put air down through your bronchioles and they're narrow. You get a wheezing sound. Some people have what they call cough variant asthma. So you see cough down here, where instead of wheezing, they cough. It's not a hacking cough. It's a <coughs> like they can't catch their breath. Um, it is a true, you know, it's a true problem in asthma and they will do um, also do well with albuterol. So you can still give them albuterol even though they're not wheezing. Um, the other thing that remind me about the coughing is sometimes when we're giving people albuterol treatments, okay, they actually start coughing like that. And that's actually a good sign. That means that they're starting to open up. And the right way to tell somebody to, be, uh, to breathe albuterol is for them to breathe it in and hold it for a second. So breathe it in deeply, hold it for a second, and then exhale. Now, they're not going to be able to do that on every breath. But if you can get them to do it every third breath, every fifth breath, whatever, to just take a nice deep breath through the nebulizer, hold it for a second, and then they're going to kind of have to cough it out. But that keeps it down in their alveoli so that the medication can actually be absorbed into their bloodstream and cause the bronchoconstriction. Okay. Tachypnea is the medical term for rapid breathing. Tachycardia, obviously the term for rapid heartbeat. So people having asthma attacks become tachypnic. They breathe fast. They become tachycardic as a compensatory mechanism also because they're scared because they can't catch their breath. Cyanosis is a very, very, very late sign in any respiratory problem. So if you see a person who's having trouble breathing with cyanosis, it's a very late sign. Most of us have never seen respiratory cyanosis. Um, you may have seen cyanosis when you look at your kids in the swimming pool and their lips are blue, right? So, but that is not cyanosis from lack of oxygen because you're having a breathing problem. That's cyanosis because they're cold. And when you're cold, you shunt blood away from the surface. So what happens is the lips, right? You're not getting enough blood to your lips because it's towards the surface and they appear cyanotic, but it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with breathing problems. Accessory muscle use means that you're going to see them, what, you know, our normal muscles are breathing, are our diaphragm and our intercostals. And you're going to see them using their neck or actually tugging in between their ribs where their intercostals are. They can't speak in full sentences, right? So that's always a classic sign. They get scared and anxious because they're hypoxic. And asthma is a problem with not inhaling, but exhaling, right? So when they breathe in, the air is coming in their force and they actually opened up those narrow bronchioles. But when they go to exhale, right? That's just passive. The muscles are just kind of relaxing. And that's when you get that whistling sound. So it, they say that it takes an asthmatic twice as long to exhale as it does to inhale. So it's really an expiratory problem, not a inspiratory problem. Okay. Uh, tripoding, you know, where they're putting their hands down on the, on the seat to kind of prop themselves up, 
or you know, on the edges of the armrests to prop themselves up. That allows their diaphragm to come down a little further and they get a little more air in. So that's a thing you could see, especially in COPD ears. Um, younger children get the nasal flaring where you see this area of the, the nose, you know, as they're breathing in kind of tugging. And the worst stage of asthmatics is something called status asthmaticus. So status asthmaticus means that they are not breaking with the albuterol. They're getting tighter and tighter and they're gonna die. So what happens when you have status asthmaticus is their muscles of breathing, which is their diaphragm and intercostals, become overworked and lactic acid builds up into them and they stop moving as much air as they should. So if you had to move air from the top of your nose okay, all the way down to your bronchioles, all the way down to your alveoli. The average, say, five foot six to six foot person, that requires 150 mLs of air to move air from your nose all the way down, okay? When you breathe, right now, all of us are probably breathing about 500 milliliters of air. So 150 mLs gets trapped where there could be no gas exchange, right? That's the first 150 mLs. It's in your nose and your bronchioles. That means 350 make it down to your alveoli for gas exchange. And then obviously the next breath pushes that 150 that's stuck in your dead air space, your bronchioles and, and nose and mouth and all stuff down. And then, you know, the leaves 150 in there. So that's what basically happens. Now, that's how we work normally. Now, let's say your muscles got tired. And instead of moving 500 mLs of air because your muscles are tired, you move 350 mLs of air. So that means 150 still gets stuck in the dead air space. Instead of having 350 get down for a gas exchange, you only have 200 getting down. So you can see what's going to start happening is that you're not going to remove enough carbon dioxide. You're not going to bring in enough oxygen. And what happens is the patient starts to get exhausted and tired. And anybody who's having trouble breathing will never like kind of want to lay down. So when you see them starting to like fall over where they can't even stay upright, that's a sign that they've kind of moved from respiratory distress into respiratory failure and they're dying. Now, what do we do? So if you catch them early before their consciousness, level of consciousness starts to decline, you could try CPAP, right? CPAP would be a good way in a conscious patient who's having trouble breathing, preventing them from going into respiratory muscle fatigue or respiratory failure, because when they do breathe in, it forces more air down there. So it keeps their tidal volume up and it keeps their oxygenation level good and it helps them remove a lot of CO2. But if they're already too far gone, you know, we have to talk about the contraindications to CPAP. So when can we not use CPAP? So one of the big ones is a blood pressure below 90. And that's because when you put somebody on CPAP, you increase the pressure in their chest, in their thorax. And if you increase the pressure in their thorax higher than the blood pressure in their veins, their superior interferon vita cava, bringing blood back to the right side of the heart, you're not going to get any blood back to the heart. You're going to kill them. So if somebody starts with a blood pressure that's low, then that pressure in their superior interferon vita cava are low. So we never put um, CPAP on somebody with a low blood pressure. And I think they... And the BLS protocol defined it as 90, systolic 90. You don't want to put it on somebody who has a decreased level of consciousness. So a normal glass glaucoma scale is 15. On the CPAP protocol, it says if somebody's 14 or below. So there's some of you right now that are tired of listening to me and your, your glass glaucoma scale is 14, right? So that doesn't mean that they have to be greatly um, diminished. But if they're not 100% awake, we can't put CPAP on them. If they've moved to this respiratory muscle fatigue, we can't put CPAP on them because remember CPAP's not a ventilator. It requires the patient to be conscious, alert, and wants to work with the machine to help them breathe. So if they're already too far gone and they've moved into this respiratory muscle fatigue, then you have to use the bag valve mask. And the rule with the bag valve mask is that if a patient lets you, if a patient who's having trouble breathing lets you put a bag valve mask on them, then they need it. In other words, that means they're lying flat and they're not going to fight that bag going over their, that mask going over their face. So that means they need it. So if you put try to bag somebody because you think they're too far gone for CPAP and they fight it off, they're not too far gone for CPAP. CPAP. Then you sit them up and put them on CPAP. Now remember, not every patient is going to, you know, love CPAP. A lot of people will fight it from the claustrophobia standpoint, but you know, if they let you use it, then it could be something that's very helpful. And remember, the new protocol says we could use CPAP in congestive heart failure like we always did, but it also says we could use it in asthma and COPD and a lot of other conditions. And you know, depending on the CPAP you've purchased, it is possible to pipe in albuterol with that. So if you're having an asthmatic or COPD or you can use the albuterol. Because remember in the new um, protocols, they didn't limit um, albuterol to just asthmatics anymore. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so any questions so far on respiratory muscle fatigue, CPAP or anything like that? 
Okay. So we know what the lungs look like. Uh, when we're talking about having bronchospasm, we're talking about these yellow tubes or your bronchioles that tie into your alveoli and that you know, this is where the spasming is happening. So it's hard to get, the air goes into the alveoli, it's hard to get the air to go out. So you can't get rid of your CO2. That's the main problem. Now, what they told us with the COVID patient is that it's actually better for them to use their meter dose inhaler or their puffer than it is for us to give them a nebulizer. It's not really better for them, it's better for us. And again, we don't wanna use nebulizers unless we have viral filters on it. Okay, so any patient who's wheezing or has that that weak and effective cough, like uh, the cough variant asthma can be given albuterol. Okay, you have to have training in using it and your ambulance corps has to have approval from the region to use it, which I believe Feist has. Okay, and we're gonna give a prepackaged albuterol. I'll show you what it looks like. It contains 2.5 milligrams and three mLs of normal saline. Okay, and you're gonna run the nebulizer at four to six liters per minute. Uh, less than four doesn't tend to nebulize it. More than six tends to use it up too fast. You do not need to um, delay transport, okay, to give them an albuterol treatment. So you can, you know, get them down to the ambulance and do it en route. Um, you know, you don't need to uh, stay in the house and finish it. In, in fact, sometimes the problem with staying in the house and finishing it is that you may make them 100% better and then they don't want to go and they're going to have a repeat asthma attack, you know, a couple hours later type of thing, okay. Um, you're allowed to give up to three doses of albuterol. The time in between would be the time it takes you to finish the albuterol. Remember that after a couple of minutes of albuterol going in, it's not going to mist as much, but you would take it out of their mouth, hold it in your hands and kind of slap it, and it'll, you'll get a few more minutes of, uh, of nebulization out of it. Okay, it's a bronchodilator, okay, so it opens up those narrow bronchioles. And I wrote minimal side effects, but actually some of these side effects are, you know, quite uncomfortable to patients and, and quite apparent in them. So a lot of people do get tachycardic. A lot of people do feel like their heart pounding. A lot of people get jittery and nervous and stuff like that. Um, I've used albuterol once in my life. I had a bad bronchitis and I was sick for like two or three days, moping around, couldn't breathe. My wife got tired of hearing me and she's like, just tell the paramedics to come and give you albuterol treatment. And I said, there's no way I'm having the paramedics come to my house. So I actually got dressed, snuck over to the paramedic station, stole the albuterol, stole the nebulizer, came home and took an albuterol treatment. And within 10 minutes I could breathe wonderfully but I could not sleep that night because I was so tachycardic and so jittery from the side effect of albuterol because I never used it before. So that, you know, all these are possible, definitely possible uh, side effects. Okay, so again, it comes 2.5 milligrams and three mLs. Okay, we're gonna run it in an nebulizer at four to six liters per minute. Okay, and you can give it up to three doses, right? So you can repeat, give the first one and then repeat it two more times up to a total of three. We know we're gonna show you how to put the nebulizer together. I'll show you how to add the medications. You're gonna put it to your oxygen regulator, set it at six. And again, we said it's better for the patient every so often to take a deep breath and hold it, okay? For the very young patients, sometimes there's spacers devices you can use um, and different de uh, devices that you could use. But most, my, my impression of most of the younger patients, they've used it so many times that they actually can set it up quicker than you can and give it to themselves quicker than you can. So the nebulizer comes, and again, there's many different kinds, but comes in a bag with multiple different pieces. So this and this, this gets screwed on top of here. This is the medication chamber where the nebulization takes place. I usually put it all together before I put the medication in. Some people pour the medication right in here, but I tend to sp spill it then. So I screw it all together and then I squirt it down here, okay? And then after you get this together, the oxygen will plug in on the bottom. Sometimes the oxygen is color-coded where, you know, this may be green or blue and it'll be color-coded green or blue, okay, and so on. Uh, usually it's blue and the blue plugs over here and then the other side is green, which goes to the oxygen tank. This is called the T piece. It's the wrong way, but this part goes right over here and it kind of looks like that. And then you get a mouthpiece that goes, um, you know, on one end. Some of them have some corrugated tubing. If you were looking at that viral filter before, that viral filter would go right over here. So it would prevent when the patient exhales from the stuff going back into the ambulance for putting you in danger and stuff. And again, because I know a lot of people signed in late, uh, we're trying not to give patients nebulizers in the back of ambulances because of the danger of the you know, COVID virus. So if you don't have a viral filter, you probably should not be giving nebulizers. Okay, um, this is how arabuterol comes. Some people have it different ways, but you basically you know, twist this off. Um, when you're holding it, try not to have your finger here and on the back, try to have your finger on the side and the side, because if you put any pressure on the, this side of it, when you unscrew this, it sprays out and you just waste it and get in your eyes and stuff. This is what the, 
corrugated tubing would look like. Again, if there's a, if there's a COVID situation, the viral filter would go over here and you wouldn't have this tubing. This is a nebulizer mask. So most of the ambulance cores don't have these. The paramedics have these, most of the ambulance cores don't. Um, but you can make it this out of a non-rebreather. Just grab the bag where it plugs in to the mask of the non-rebreather and yank it out and then pull the gaskets that are over these holes here. Now on the non-rebreather, they're not huge holes like this, but you'll accomplish the same thing. The difference with this is if you're using the nebulizer, okay, what would happen is you wouldn't be putting the T piece on here. So this would plug into the bottom of the mask. So right over here, when you screw it together, would plug into the bottom of the mask over here, right over here, okay? Um, and again, not widely used, but sometimes in older people, um, you know, they don't want to hold it. And sometimes with kids, we won't usually strap it to their face, but we'll have the parents, you know, hold it close to their face and stuff like that. Okay, so the last thing, and then I'll let everybody go, is that in the new collaborative protocol, there's an additional treatment for asthmatics, but this is a medical control option, which means you cannot do it on your say-so. This is using the EpiPen, which is standing order in anaphylaxis, but this is asthma, okay? Um, it would be that if you have a dying asthmatic that can no longer use albuterol because their level of consciousness is so decreased and their tidal volume is so poor and they can't breathe it in and they're dying in front of you, you could call medical control for permission to use the EpiPen on them. Now, the dosing is exactly the same as you would if you, and again, if you're doing check and inject, that's, you know, check and inject is fine also. It doesn't have to be the EpiPen. Okay, so the dosing would be exactly the same, which is if it's an adult patient, which is not defined by age, is defined by weight. And the weight is either 30 kilograms or 66 pounds, you know, depending on what uh, unit of measurement you use, they would be an adult. And if they're an adult, they get the 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine. Sometimes it's abbreviated as 0 0.03 or, you know, um, but most of the time it's 0 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine, okay. Um, again, we give intramuscular injections and, it, you know, with check and inject, it's the deltoid muscle. If you were trained in giving a deltoid intramuscular injection because you were trained in check and inject, when you're using the EpiPen, you should not give it in the thigh like you usually do. You should actually give it in the deltoid muscle because the absorption of medication in the deltoid muscle is like two or three times faster than in the thigh. The thigh is only the site for a patient to give it to themselves because it's easier for a patient to give it in their thigh. Um, and we were trained that way before we trained EMTs to give uh, intramuscular injections. But now that you're trained, you're allowed to give it in their arm, whether you're using the EpiPen or the check and inject. Um, you know, just remember that some patients may like wonder why you're doing that because that's not how they are trained. And you could just explain to them that it's a better way to give the medication. That's how we do it, okay? What does epinephrine do? So epinephrine causes massive and quick bronchodilation. It was the only drug we had to use to treat asthma years and years and years ago until it was albuterol. So every asthmatic, if you go back uh, 20 years ago, got subcutaneous epinephrine for asthma. The reason we got away from it is albuterol does the same thing, but is less stressful on the heart. So there's a term called myocardial oxygen demand, which means how much oxygen the heart needs to do what it needs to do at any given time. So if somebody's having an asthma attack and they can't get enough oxygen to start with, and now you give them a drug like epinephrine, which makes their heart pound, they need more oxygen, but they're having an asthma attack and they can't get it. So there was always a theoretical concern that bad things could happen. So that's why we use albuterol more now than we use epi. But if they're dying and you can't get anything in their mouth, then you know you have to uh, you have to give them the EpiPen. But again, it's a medical control option, which means you have to speak to the doctor to get permission to do it. Again, adults or anybody over 66 pounds or 30 kilos, they get the 0.3 milligrams of the epinephrine. Okay, and pediatrics is less than uh, 66 pounds or 30 kilograms. They get the 0.15 dose or the junior EpiPen. Okay, so we're gonna stop here. Um, let me see if there's any um, questions on the chat. Uh, does not seem to be any questions on the chat. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. Does anybody have any questions, anything we went over? No? Okay, was this a good way of doing it? Yes? Okay, so I guess we will continue um, with this way. And like I said, I will email out the link to the test. I will email out the slides and I will email out the, video, the link to the video once it's all done. And other than that, everybody should stay safe. Okay, and uh, hopefully we're on the downslide of, uh, of this thing. And um, at our high point tonight, we had 30 people signed on. So it was, uh, 
definitely a good attendance. Okay, any questions? Okay, everybody have a good night and I'll get everything out with the next, uh, at least a test out and the slides out in the next uh, 30 minutes. Take care.